Now, more than a decade later after I wrote that work, <clears throat> it's clear that both fields, indigenous media and ethnographic film, have continued to develop in the context of the dizzying proliferation of media forms and images that distinguish the contemporary era. From the vantage point of the early 21st century, it's hard to imagine that just over a decade ago, some scholars were assuming that the uptake of media in indigenous communities would be the death knell of, in quotes, authentic cultural practices, whatever that means, despite considerable evidence to the contrary. The, in other words, how, you know, who's gonna police what authenticity is, right? So the broader question is raised, what I call the Faustian contract, um, as to whether indigenous or indeed minority or uh, dominated subjects anywhere can assimilate dominant media to their own cultural and political concerns, um, or will they be inevitably compromised by its presence, haunted much of the research and debate on the topic of the cross-cultural spread of media. <clears throat> Surveying the field now, from the, I, I started out doing this in 1988, so I have some perspective. So surveying it from the, up to the vantage point of 2010, the opposite is indeed turned out to be the case. In my, in my view, that's not surprising. Indigenous media work has shown itself to be a particularly robust form of contemporary cultural objectification. From small-scale video and local radio, to archival websites, to national television stations and feature films, Indigenous media makers worldwide have found opportunities for cultural creativity of all sorts. These projects often support the maintenance or even revival of ritual practices and local languages, while building forms of cultural labor that can repair fraying intergenerational relationships and bring much needed sources of productive activity and at times income into communities that suffer often from high rates of poverty, unemployment, and alienation. Today we were just talking um, Oh, and Dan Swan about how in some communities the kids really want to pick up the video cameras and don't know what to do and the elders are like, we know what you can do with those. And it's created really um, strong relationships between generations that otherwise might not have found that kind of ground to um, reproduce knowledge from an older era into a newer one. <clears throat> Um, so the work has developed across a range of technologies and community or institutional bases, most notably um, local community radio, sometimes two-way, small format local productions originally produced in analog video in the 1980s and now increasingly on digital video, um, the creation of local and, re local and regional television over the last two decades, facilitated initially by the launch of communication satellites over remote areas of um, Australia and Canada in particular, and um, the remote living indigenous populations there fought back and demanded to have their own television practice. Um, Asuma TV in Nunavut, Canada, created by Ibulik Asuma, uh, and the emergence of four indigenously run national television stations since 1999, with the debut of the Aboriginal People's Television Network in Canada. And this is my favorite show, I think Kristen's too, <laughs> Cooking with the Wolf Band. Um, and uh, Maui TV in uh, New Zealand, Aotearoa. Here, nice hair, eh? uh, and uh, which has been very robust, um, partially because uh, you know these are often very um, uh, the the the. The proportion of indigenous people in the population has a big impact on, um, let's say, how much income the state might deliver to projects like this. So because Maori are 15% of the population as opposed to 2 or 3% in Australia, for example, um, there's a, a lot more um, resources available for them. So a second language, a second channel was uh, created in 2007 that's entirely in uh, the Maori language, a very big issue in language revitalization there. Um, and this is, um, uh, Aroha, it's a series of contemporary love stories, all in the Maori language. Uh, and then in 2005, the Taiwan Indigenous Television Network. And then finally, in 2007, National Indigenous Television in Australia. Um, I don't have time to go into it. All of these have their costs and benefits. So when, you, when you go to, to the scale of the national, you know, certain things might be compromised in ways that not everyone is happy with. So I'd be happy to talk about that later. Um, and then finally, um, the emergence of uh, fiction and feature filmmaking. Uh, indeed, by now there are about 50 indigenously directed feature films that have been made worldwide, which have um, arguably contributed to indigenous filmmaking taking its place as a form of world cinema on the global stage, circulating not only through a lively circuit of indigenous film festivals, <coughs> but also in mainstream venues such as the Cannes Film Festival, um, 
which this year uh, awarded the Camador the prize for the best first feature to an indigenous film from Australia, Samson and Delilah, um, and the Toronto International Film Festival, the Sundance Film Festival, uh, famously gives enormous support to Native filmmaking. Um, they're all arenas that not only showcase such work, but in, case, in many cases help support its development. At these festivals, Indigenous features have gone on to pick up major prizes, and these in turn serve as important forms of cultural capital that can be turned into resources to continue to support their work. Um, this is an image of the festival that um, was actually a showcase that uh, Kristen mentioned, and um, I did indeed help organize it, but I had fantastic collaborators with um, a curator at the Museum of Modern Art who's been very supportive of showcasing indigenous work, <coughs> Sally Berger, and my longstanding colleagues at the National Museum of the American Indian. So we brought 20 filmmakers from all over the world to show their features, first in New York at the Museum of Modern Art, at a, importantly, at a mainstream cultural institution. Um, which was a very important statement for people to say. And then all went down to Washington, D.C. and showed their films again at the National Museum of the American Indian, which had just been over that year. So these are just represent, we have a really good website if you want to see it. Um, <clears throat> and then, there we go, that's a production still from Samson and Delilah. Um, so, and then onward beyond feature films, digital media raise important questions that bring us back to some of the basic issues about representation and the materiality of different media from the kind of virtual world and the problem it creates, suggested an opening example, to other concerns about the increasing stratification of media practices that are dependent on literacy-based media forms and the availability of broadband, as the cartoon showed, um, and that undergird the shift to the digital from analog formats, and I think some of the costs of that shift are not well appreciated. Um, uh, along with some other geeks at NYU, we wanted to make uh, t-shirts that said, um, analog video and nostalgia. The people who laugh in this room are my fellow geeks. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> for example, Assume TV uh, and its latest retooling, the Nunavut Independent TV Network, or NITV, a second NITV, launched in uh, May of 2009, exploits the possibilities of the digital for providing alternative ways of circulating indigenous media around the world to other communities, whose very remoteness has made access difficult through conventional means of distribution. And then finally, whoops, indigenous archives based on the repatriation of ethnographic and other films and photographs made in earlier, often colonial eras, uh, have become an increasingly important and very exciting social practice enhanced by mindful use of digital technologies, often created through deeply collaborative creative partnerships with technically skilled uh, fellow travelers, indigenous and non-indigenous, as they together imagine and invent new ways to build in cultural protocols, non-alphabetic language, um, and other groundbreaking work in, re, in what I would call indigenizing the software that otherwise might not be usable in certain areas. Um, so for example, Ara Yadidija in Australia, Ara Yadidija means uh, stories from long ago, is a mostly monolingual community of Bindijara speakers, and so people worked for um, a long time to create a software that allowed them to take on these little mobile units um, digit, recently digitized collections of uh, photographs reaching back 40 years um, out to um, camps in remote areas where people could interact with them with this, with this particular software interface that didn't require um, literacy or English um, to, start, to start getting um, local commentary on what in fact those photographs were about and then, they all come, then the little carts come back and they download all the information and um, send them out again. And they have restricted arenas for um, photographs that are things that shouldn't be seen by men or women or, <coughs> or uh, photographs of deceased people that shouldn't be circulated to their kin and so forth. It's a very clever project, but that's the little, that little orange thing. You're like, what is that? That's the little cart that goes out and it's purpose-built for this project. 